This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Noon at the Sucker Sunday United Methodist Church, November 15, 2020. The message is, How to Wait Well When Waiting is Hard too, based on 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-11. Now we will read the first uh, the Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. This is the word of, the God, uh, of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you join me as I pray? A loving, gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to come together as your people. And as one body of Christ, we thank you for this opportunity to worship indoor, to worship online. As we listen to the words of Scripture, O oh God, open our hearts and minds. Fill us our heart with your life-giving, life-changing words so that we become more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's say you are an artist and you were asked to draw a painting entitled The End of the World. What would you like to draw? What image comes to your mind as you think of it? Is it a promising utopian one? Or dark or gloomy dystopian one. What would the end of the world look like in your painting? Just think for a moment. Well, in fact, many people, including Christians, rarely have a promising or positive image of the end of the world. Whether it's from the books or movies or television, television series, it seems the end of the world is portrayed with an existential fear or threat. Right, everything from alien attacks to zombies to natural catastrophe or to a nuclear weapons. One of the end of the world movies that I enjoyed watching uh, recent, recently is Seeking to Friend Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. This movie portrays a world where 70 mile a big rock is hurtling straight toward the earth. Space shuttle mission to destroy this rock has failed, so there is no hero like Bruce Willis in this movie. Radio stations have countdowns, in the wake of this impending doom, people are going nuts. Riots everywhere. Some people stealing 
the wide big TV screen, no matter how few days are left to watch it. In the midst of it, there are mass baptism going on in churches. Other people enjoy parties every day. And there's a man named Dutch, a faithful insurance salesman. Despite the fact that the world might soon be ending, Dutch goes into work as though nothing happened. And also he uh, recommends high premium Armageddon package to his customers. The end of the world this movie portrays is far from promising. It's not a happy ending. It's not a happy ending either. But the beauty of this movie is that it portrays how ordinary people react when they knew the world was going to end soon. It shows people's different responses when they know exactly how many days are left in their lives. It touches on a fundamental question of what we are seeking in our lives that will come to an end someday. Ironically, thinking about final things makes us think of where we are now and where we are going. This morning we read 1 Thessalonians 5 according to the lectionary reading. This is Paul's letter to Thessalonian Christians. And in this letter, Paul talks about final things. The last days called the day of the Lord which is mentioned over a thousand times throughout the Bible, especially apocalyptic writings such as the book of Daniel, the book of Revelations. The apocalyptic literature emerged as part of a people's struggle to figure out the problem of evil, suffering, especially the suffering of the righteous, suffering of the faithful. The background for the book of Daniel was a Babylonian captivity, the book of Revelation was written by John when he was exiled to the island Pamos. When the world seems full of grief, suffering, injustice, people charges the question, where is God and what is God doing? And the day of the Lord is a future time when God will intervene directly and dramatically in world affairs to get things right and to bring justice and fairness to the world. Then why is Paul talking about the day of the Lord in his letter? This is a letter called the pastoral letter. Why, would, why, why, he, why he talks about this last things, the final things, the end of the world, the day of the Lord. Why would he want to talk about it? First, we need to understand the circumstances these first century Christians were facing at the time. This community of faith, uh, faithful Christians in Thessalonica, Thessalonica was established by Paul during his second mission trip around AD 51. And it's known that he wrote this letter two or three uh, years after his uh, mission trip. Christian believers there were being persecuted by the Jews and Roman authorities. Just like all of us, Thessalonian Christians came face to face with the issue of mortality. But the early death of their fellow Christians were especially puzzling and troubling to them. Why? Because they were eagerly and actively waiting for the return of Christ. Last Sunday, we talked about how difficult it is to wait the um, uncertain waits, right? Thessalonian Christians also had a problem with waiting. They were becoming more and more impatient with waiting. They thought that Christ would return immediately before their own death. Therefore, they were greatly troubled and confused when their loved ones died because they expected Christ come and return beforehand. As their spiritual leader, Paul was aware of people's different reactions to this difficult reality, the reality that didn't make sense 
to the congregation of Thessalonian church. So the reason why Paul talks about the end of the world, the, end, the day of the Lord in this letter, is to encourage the first century Christians to be, to be faithful, to stay faithful, and to stay awake in the midst of confusion and suffering. He writes this letter to assure them of their hope of the sure return of Christ that will come like a thief in the night or come like a labor pains on a pregnant woman. He writes this pastoral letter to remind them of the sure hope of resurrection in Christ our Lord and Savior. It was a message given to the brokenhearted by loss, grief, Overwhelmed by sorrow, it's a reminder of, of what it means to wait well. In this letter, Paul gives them a handful of reminders, kind of the practical advice for how to wait well, how to prepare ourselves for the return of Christ. We didn't read the entire chapter 5 today, but just the first 11 verses this morning, but in chapter 5, Paul encourages them to warn the, the idle, avoid evil, encourage the timid, help the weak, the patient with everyone, be kind to everyone, joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. He doesn't talk about these in future tense. He doesn't address these things as a future matter, but things to do in the present. He addresses it as the present matter. He talks about the need to stay awake and sober at the moment. He talks about what they need to wear now. Wear faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Something Christians should make sure that they are putting on at the moment, not just in the future. Last Sunday, we read the parable of ten bridesmaids. In her commentary on this parable, Caroline Lewis, professor of preaching at Luther Seminary, points out that difficulty with waiting is not a spectrum of feelings that we are experiencing, but the fact that we cannot seem to be content with the present. Some people escape to the past or to the future because they find the present too, too painful to face. I did some research on apocalyptic movies. The number of movies on this topic of end of the world has significantly increased over the last 10 years from 2010 to 2020. There are a lot of movies, about 100 movies were produced and released. The number was almost double compared to the period of 2000 to 2010. We are aware that after the outbreak of COVID-19, some people of faith, especially the fundamentalist Christians, claim that the spread of COVID-19 is more than a serious health threat. They see it as an impending sign of the end of the world. And we know this type of narrative has been repeated throughout the history. Every time we had the massive tragedies. In a sense, this cultural religious phenomenon reflects how discontent people are with the present. People's obsession with the past or future has more to do with how they feel about the present. This is what makes Paul's teaching more insightful and relevant to contemporary Christians like us. Paul encourages us to stay awake to the gift of present that often comes to us as a package deal. The package deal of joy and sadness, gratitude and discontentment. If we are not awake, as Paul mentioned, as Paul teaches in this letter, it is quite easy for us to dismiss this 
precious gift given by God. Friends, each moment, each day as God's gifts comes with different wrapping paper and different outlooks. And what we are called to do as the children of light is to embrace this precious gift by living in the present and finding our connection to eternity in that moment. You know, one of those grammar jokes, the past, the present, future, walk into a bar, it was tense. The theological tension between how we make sense of the past, the present, and the future in relationship to each other has long and complicated history. Since the church's earliest days, Christians have struggled to balance hopeful expectation of Christ's return and patience settling down in the present age. How do we stay hopeful for the return of Christ and at the same time stay awake to the gift of the present? That's a question, important question we all are wrestling with as Christians. I'm sure many of you have heard and read these phrases from the unknown writer before. Don't cry over the past. It's gone. Don't stress about the future. It hasn't arrived. Live in the present and make it beautiful. It's a great words of wisdom. There's some truth to it. The Christian eschatology, which is a theology that talks about the last things, would put it this way. Don't cry over the past. It made who you are now. Don't stress about the future. We don't know what holds the future, but we know who holds the future. Stay so somber and awake to the gift of, of the present. Leave your today as the children of light and walk as the children of the day. This is the wording based on the post letter that we read this morning. I know sometimes days seem so hard to walk, especially when your loved one is no longer walking with you on this journey. You feel weary, your whole body cries out for you to stop. And this is when friends and family are most needed. In verse 11, Paul writes, Therefore, encourage one another, build each other up. Just as, in fact, you are doing. Remember in the beginning I talked about the movie Seeking a Friend for the End of Time. One of the most memorable dialogue in this movie was when Dot shared about his own end-of-days plan with his neighbor, uh, Penny. As the, day, as the days running out, they sort through their feelings together. And the penny asked Dodge, so what are you doing with the rest of your life? Dodge answers, well, catching up on some me time. Find God and maybe move around some chairs. It was Dodge's end of day's plan. Certainly these are the things that could be done. Anytime, regardless of this impending doom, but were not done because of his busy work schedule. We know catching up on some me time, finding God, moving around some chairs didn't have to be his end of day's plan. Eventually, Dodge found a meaningful thing to do for his remaining days on earth, seeking a friend to listen, support, and journey through the last moment of his life. Now think for a moment, friends. What would be your end of day's plan if you are in Dodge's shoes? If you are in Dodge's situation, what would be your end of day's plan? 
You know, it doesn't have to, whatever that you think of, it doesn't have to be plans that can be executed only when you know how many days are left in your life. It can be done today. It can be executed now. I read an article about a man who worked as a taxi driver for many years. It's a real story. One day he got a phone call to pick up a passenger in the middle of the night. When he arrived at the address, the uh, building was dark and except a light in a ground floor window. Many drivers would just wait for a couple of minutes and drive away in, a, in such a situation. But he thought this passenger might need some assistance. So he went to the door and knocked. He heard a weak voice of an elderly woman and the door opened. He saw a, a small lady in her 80s wearing a dress and a pillbox hat. She had a small suitcase in her, in her hands. He took the lady's suitcase and helped her to walk to the, to the cab. When they got into the cab, the old lady told the address and asked, could you drive through downtown? Oh, it's not the shortest way, though, the driver says. He says she says, I know, but there's no rush, as I'm on my way to a hospice. I have no family left. He noticed tears in her eyes. He quietly switches off the meter and asks what route she would like him to take. While he drove the, through the city, the old lady showed him the places that were important to her, the building where she worked as an elevator operator, the house where she and her husband lived just after their wedding, the warehouse where there was a bowling many years ago, so she went dancing there when she was a young girl. After two days of Two, two hours of driving, she silently said, I'm tired, let's, let's go now. As soon as they arrived at this address, two staff person, persons from a hospice were waiting for her. The taxi driver took the lady's suitcase while she was seated in the wheelchair. Tell me how much I owe you, she asked. And he said, um, you owe me nothing. But you have to make a living, the, uh, the lady insisted. There, there are other passengers, he replied, and gave her a hug. And she held on to him tightly and said, Thank you for giving, giving me those moments of joy. And the driver said, Ma'am, this drive was the most important thing that I've done in my life. You know, as I was reading this story, I prayed that my role as a pastor, maybe the role of this tax driver to faithfully accompany the children of God by listening to their stories, celebrating, appreciating who they are before the Lord, and working, walking with them in the midst of joys and struggles, sadness and happiness. And friends, my prayers are with each of you as you Go and serve your calling, your own calling as a taxi driver in someone's life. You never know how long you will be able to travel with people in your life. It makes us very sad and frazzled sometimes, but it also makes us humble and stay awake to the very gift of the present that God has given each of us. In our relationship with fellow Christians, we are called to be a taxi driver, encouraging one another and building each other up in the name of Jesus Christ. So friends, seek a friend that is in Jesus Christ. Seek friends who support one another and build us up in, in our life journey. As you stay awake to the gift of the present, may each of you be reminded that only God, only God can turn a message, I mean mess, into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph.
and a victim into a victory. Amen.